Okay, welcome to episode 52 of the iPad podcast by Lex at Max Future, and it's May 1st, May Day, and there's a lot of things to cover on this first day of May, a lot of stuff relating to the iPad. I'm going to first start off with news and then maybe go over some of the interesting apps and products that relate to the iPad, maybe throw in a tip or two. Okay, let's start off with a really sort of positive story about the iPad, and it's entitled Game Over, iPad Wins, Android Loses. And I think this is a a good overview of the state of the iPad, and it's by a website called uh, IT Management, I guess, or Data Datamation, and it's by someone named Mike Mike Elgin, and it's a very well-written article. And basically... Here are some of the points he makes. You know, he basically says the touch tablet market is still in its cradle and already Apple has won. He says that the iPad now has such a lead so vast that it will not and cannot be dislodged from its position of dominance. And he goes on to say, look, the people who are Google Android fans believe that finally a real shipping tablet specific version of open source sourced Android exists and so that that's going to somehow crush the iPad and he says this is wishful thinking based on false belief an inadequate appreciation for the primacy of apps and a destructive power of platform fragmentation now he goes on to say the tablet version of Android version 3.0 which is codenamed Honeycomb is neither real neither shipping nor open source And I think he makes some good points, which is that the Honeycomb, if you went out and bought an Android tablet now, you'll be lucky if you get one with Honeycomb on it, which is the operating system for Android that is made for a tablet. And apparently it's in beta, so it's not really like in a good, good shape. So it's not really, you need a tablet operating system to compete with the iPad. The other thing is, he's right, there's a fragmentation of the platform. Not only are different hardware manufacturers putting on different uh, versions of Android on various devices, but different Android distributors are creating their own Android stores. So there's there's no unified Android app store. Like, for example, Amazon has its own Android app store. Google has an Android app store. BlackBerry is going to have some sort of Android-like um, you know, capabilities on the playbook. And even, I guess, the Nook has some, you know, Barnes & Noble's the Nook has Android. But, but apparently, it's not so clear. Like, what happens if you buy a, uh, an Android app on the Nook and then you you no longer want the Nook and you buy another Android device. Are you going to be able to download that app or are you going to have to buy it again? And it's not so clear that you're going to be able to download it again for free. You you might not be able to take your apps from one Android device to another depending on what store you bought it at. Then he goes on to say that some of these initial tablets like the Zoom aren't are, aren't so good because they're using this premature premature honeycomb on it. And he, and he basically points out that Motorola has sold far fewer units than previously thought, possibly as few as 25,000 or as many as 125,000. And he says there's going to be huge excess of inventory and that Motorola is going to be dumping, dumping um, its tablet, the Zoom, at insane discounts, which will create downward price pressure on the entire Android tablet mark market erasing profit margins so his point is that it's going to be hard for you know these manufacturers to keep up with the ipad which has a built-in profit to it but is still reasonably priced so you know his point is that apple has a huge lead with the ipad and you know the big thing is that there are just so many apps you know, so his point is that as of as of this writing, 
there are only 200 apps created specifically for the tablet version of Android. And there are zero playbook apps and zero touchpad apps. Touchpad being the, Hew the Hewitt Packard tablet that's supposed to come out this summer. And his points, I think a very valid point, which is one of the reasons you should stick with the iPad is that there are something like 82,670 specific iPad apps in the, in the app store. And it's going to be hard for competitors to come up with that. So to some extent, Apple is in the situation that Windows was in in the, in the uh, personal computer market, which is a lot of people bought per PCs and Windows PCs because they knew it would be compatible with a vast Windows software market. And I remember like in the early 90s, late 80s, when I had a Mac and I was trying to convince friends of mine to switch to a Mac, they were like, yeah, but there are these programs that I'm not going to be able to run the Mac and certain games and stuff like that, or Microsoft Office, I'm, I'm not going to be able to run it on a Mac. And with the iPad, Apple is like in a huge, you know, lead. And this is what this guy Elgin is basically saying. And he's also making the point about the App Store confusion. He says that Google has failed to create a cohesive single App Store, so everyone is rushing in with their own App Stores. So, look, I, I think right now, if you're, if you're listening to this show and you're thinking, should I get an iPad or should I wait and get Hewitt Packard's touchpad, which is going to be on a different operating system, or the Playbook by BlackBerry, which is on an even different operating system, or some Android device, I think you got to go with the iPad because simply because, one, the hardware is now second generation and you have a much deeper bench in terms of, of um, apps that you can get. Another concern is you buy a touchpad or a Playbook, how are you going to know that the company is still going to be making those devices a year from now or two years from now? They may just pull themselves out of the market. Apple, as the front, run, front, front runner, you know is going to come out with iPad updates every year. So anyways, you know, I think, I think Egan makes good points, and I, I think that the iPad's in a very healthy state right now. Well, this was a big week for iPad around the world because the iPad started selling in 12 more markets, including Japan, India, and China. And the unofficial Apple weblog had an article titled iPad 2's Japan India release draws big crowds. And apparently in Japan there were huge lines. The article says early adopters in Japan began to line up as early as 9 p.m. the night before the launch and sometimes had to endure heavy rain while they waited. The rain, and it says the rain was not a d deterrent at the flagship Ginza Apple store in Tokyo. It had a line over three blocks long when the store opened at 9 a.m. Similarly, in India, uh, apparently crowds were greeted with bouquets of flowers. And, um, you know, so, we're, you know, we're going to see huge demand in China and in India and in Japan. And hopefully the, um, in China, the article says that the, the iPad, you know, was selling really briskly. So hopefully this will take some of the pressure off of those stores in the United States where people line up to buy the iPad 2 and then sell them in China at like double or triple the cost. With these iPads now being sold more overseas, we'll see maybe less of the people who sort of wait in line, buy the iPad, and then sell it overseas. And so maybe this will bring down the waiting period in the United States for iPads as the demand is greater outside the United States. Now, last week I talked about one competitor to the iPad being RIM's playbook that came out. Another potential challenger to the iPad came out uh, in recently and was reviewed this week by the famous technology reviewer Walter Mossberg at the Wall Street Journal. And the, the tablet was something that T-Mobile put out called the G Slate. And it was built by LG and sold by T-Mobile, or it is sold by, by T-Mobile. And on its face, it seems like it would, might be a potential real challenger to the iPad 2. But Walt Mossberg concluded that it is no iPad. 
And what's interesting about the G Slate is that it's an Android tablet. First of all, its size is different than the set typical 7-inch Android tablet that we're seeing and smaller than the 10-inch iPad. It's at 8.9 inches in size. And the other thing that it has, which is kind of cool, is that it can run on T-Mobile's 4G cellular network, which is a lot faster. Then the third thing that it has that's a, that sort of sets it apart from the pack of Android tablets is that it can record movies and you can watch them wearing glasses in 3D. So Walt Mossberg tested it, and you know one thing he pointed out in his article is that it's even though it's smaller than the iPad, it's a lot heavier. And the other thing is it's kind of expensive. So it's a lot heavier and thicker, and it costs a 32 gigabyte model without a contract, without a phone contract, costs a whopping $750. Now the entry level iPad costs only $500. And the thing is though, if you wanna get it at $530, the G Slate, you have to sign up for a two year contract that locks you in to a minimum $30 a month in payment. So that brings the total cost to $1,250. So, so far we haven't seen really good deals compared to the iPad. Because first of all, all the tablets are smaller than the iPad in screen size, yet cost more money. How is that possible? Who's gonna compete with the iPad 2 in that regard? The other thing he points out is a drawback is there are hard, hardly any uh, uh, third-party optimized apps for the tablet. You know, Apple has, I think, over 80,000 iPad-ready apps. So that's going to be a big drawback. He also says the 3D thing is kind of gimmicky. When you email the movies, you lose the 3D capability. So you can only really watch it on the, um, on the, G, the G Slate. So in all, he basically says, look, you're not going to get this unless you really love Android. Uh, and that the iPad is still a much better, a much better tablet than this device. So we'll have to see what can compete with the iPad too. Well, the chances of Android tablet apps coming coming out in large quantities may seem even more remote, given what an article in PC World says on April 26. The article is entitled "Survey: App Makers' Interest in Android Tablet Slows." And um, apparently, according to a survey from the development software maker Accelerator, they interviewed 2,760 6, 2, Accelerator developers recently, and 85% reported an interest in developing apps for Android phones, while 71% expressed an interest in making apps for Android tablets. Well, the article says while those percentages are high, they're down two to three percentage points, respectively, from the same survey done in January. And so the drop-off comes after Android has logged steady gains in developer interest over the past year. So this could be a sign that, you know, developers who used to be excited about the Android phones are not as excited about the tablets. One, it could be there, you know, that there's not a lot of tablets out there that are high-performance tablets that can compete with the iPad. That could be it. But also, the, you know, there are other tablets coming out from HP and from BlackBerry that are not Android-based. So this does not bode well for the Android tablet market. Now, last week I talked about one competitor to the iPad being RIM's Playbook that came out. Another potential challenger to the iPad came out uh, in recently and was reviewed this week by the famous technology reviewer Walter Mossberg at the Wall Street Journal. And the, the tablet was something that T-Mobile put out called the G Slate. And it was built by LG and sold by T-Mobile, or it is sold by, by T-Mobile. And on its face, it seems like it might be a potential real challenger to the iPad too. But Walt Mossberg concluded that it is no iPad. And what's interesting about the G Slate is that it's an Android tablet. First of all, its size is different than the set typical seven inch Android tablet that we're seeing. 
and smaller than the 10 inch iPad. It's at 8.9 inches in size. And the other thing that it has, which is kind of cool, is that it can run on T-Mobile's 4G cellular network, which is a lot faster. Then the third thing that it has that's a, that sort of sets it apart from the pack of Android tablets is that it can record movies and you can watch them wearing glasses in 3D. So Walt Mossberg tested it. And, you know, one thing he pointed out in his article is that it's even though it's smaller than the iPad, it's a lot heavier. And the other thing is it's kind of expensive. So it's a lot heavier and thicker. And it costs a 32 gigabyte model without a contract, without a phone contract, costs a whopping $750. Now, the entry level iPad costs only $500. And the thing is, though, if you want to get it at $530, the G Slate, you have to sign up for a two year contract that locks you in to a minimum $30 a month in payment. So that brings the total cost to $1,250. So, so far we haven't seen really good deals compared to the iPad. Because first of all, all the tablets are smaller than the iPad in screen size, yet cost more money. How is that possible? Who's gonna compete with the iPad too in that regard? The other thing he points out as a drawback is there are hard, hardly any uh, uh, third-party optimized apps for the tablet. You know, Apple has, I think, over 80,000 iPad-ready apps. So that's going to be a big drawback. He also says the 3D thing is kind of gimmicky. When you email the movies, you lose the 3D capability. So you can only really watch it on the, um, on the, G, the G slate. So... In all, he basically says, look, you're not going to get this unless you really love Android. Uh, and that the iPad is still a much better a much better tablet than this device. So we'll have to see what can compete with the iPad too. Now with, you know, all these competitors making smaller tablets compared to the iPad. You know, tablets that are 7 inches like the Kindle or the Galaxy Zoom or these, you know, even uh, RIMS Playbook question is, will Apple ever make a 7-inch tablet? And I wrote a post about this on my MaxFuture.com blog. And the post is entitled, Why Apple Can't Sell a 7-Inch iPad, colon, because there is no price point between the current iPad and the iPod Touch. And this is what I said. M you know, many people wonder why Apple won't make a 7-inch iPad in the face of various competitive tablets coming out that are around 7 inches in size and in the face of the Kindle, which is also just under 7 inches. One big reason Apple doesn't have a 7-inch iPad is because Apple can't price it without upsetting its already winning product lineup. The iPhone and iPod Touch products are already mini tablets, albeit with 3.5-inch screens. The current iPad is the big brother of those original tablets and sports a screen size that is just under 10 inches. Sure, I would like a 7-inch tablet in the mix, but how would Apple price a 7-inch tablet? And then I point out the current iPod Touch lineup starts at $229 for an 8GB iPod Touch and goes up to $399 for a 64GB iPod Touch. The iPod, iPad 2 lineup starts at $499 for 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi only model and goes up to $829. So how could Apple price a 7-inch iPad without destroying the current pricing? If Apple sells a 7-inch iPad, it would have to be less than the 10-inch iPad, which would mean less than $499. But if Apple priced the 7-inch iPad below the current iPad, it would essentially occupy the space that the iPod Touch currently occupies between $229 and $400. But, but then Apple would have to lower the price of the iPod Touches and essentially take less profit on those devices. Now, while Apple is not selling as many iPods, it is probably selling many iPod Touches. Apple is not just gaining, is, Apple is not into just gaining market share for the hell of it. Apple likes to sell products that have 40% profit built into them. To do so, Apple sells premium products. 
My view, my view is that the main reason Apple will not make an, a 7-inch iPad is that it can't sell such a device without destroying the iPod Touch's margin and making a smaller margin on the 7-inch iPad. So I think that's it. You know, I mean, Steve Jobs said a 7-inch tablet would be too small. You'd have to use little hands. But look, we're using the iPod Touch, which is three and a half inches in size, and the iPhone as mini tablets. So there, so, so there is a use for a seven-inch tablet, and there might be technological struggles with making a screen size seven inches and then having apps work across all three devices. You know what Apple does so that iPhone apps work on a 10-inch tablet is it doubles the pixels and you'd have to do some sort of funky you know massaging of the pixels so that apps would look good on a 7-inch tablet as they do on the iPhone or the iPad but I think the real reason Apple doesn't come out with a 7-inch tablet is it just how is it gonna price it it would have to drop the price of the iPod touch down to a point where it really wouldn't make much of a profit on it so I don't. That's the that's the main reason that I see that we don't have a seven inch um, tablet. Maybe at some point, if Apple can make a significant profit on the iPod Touch and drop the price, you know, like through efficiencies in manufacturing, there may come a day when the iPod Touch three and a half inch could be sold at a hundred dollars, and Apple have a forty percent margin, and maybe through manufacturing it, it could do that. But until that happens, I don't think Apple's going to make a 7-inch tablet. So now I want to talk about a solution for the iPad in terms of using external USB mic. Now, one of the things that I like to do with the iPad is use it as a content creation device, whether it's you know recording music on it or even doing this podcast on it. Sometimes I'm on the road. I like to record the podcast on my iPad and do the editing. And there's a nice app that I used called HD Recorder, but we also have GarageBand now on the iPad. And one of the frustrating things is that you cannot really use many of the great USB external microphones with the iPad because Apple has made it so that if it senses, if the iPad senses a certain power usage by these USB devices, sucking on the power of the iPad, the iPad won't let the external device microphone be used with the iPad. Now, I have the Blue Yeti microphone, which is a USB 3 condenser microphone that's, you know, very large mic and it, and it when the iPad first came out, I got the Blue Yeti and it worked with the iPad. But then in one of the updates, I don't know, several months after the iPad, Apple put in something in the software for the iPad that basically said, "No, the Blue Yeti cannot work with it." And a little a little sign would come up electronically on the iPad that would say there's too much power being drawn from the from the iPad. And I suspect this power thing affects other devices that connect by the camera dock connector to the to the iPad. So I was really frustrated. I um I actually um I emailed the jailbreak developer Ryan Petrick who makes jailbreak apps for the iPhone and the iPad. And I asked him, why doesn't he create some sort of jailbreak settings hack for the iPad to fool the iPad into allowing the Blue Yeti and other devices to uh, connect to the iPad? So you could use a real good mic with the iPad. And he didn't seem interested in doing that. And then, you know, the, recently another mic came out by the microphone manufacturer Samsung. S-A-M-S-O-N, not Samsung, like the big Korean manufacturer, but Samsung, S-O-N, and they make mics, and I think it was uh, Dan Benjamin on 5x5 who mentioned that he liked the new mic, The it's called the Samsung Meteor mic, M-E-T-E-O-R, and it's a very cool looking mic, but what captured me about it was it seemed to say that you could it would work with the iPad and, and without having to um, use some sort of ele- external power because uh, I think I mentioned this before with the Blue Yeti my solution was to get a USB powered hub and plug that powered hub into a wall socket 
and then connect that to the iPad and connect the Blue Yeti then to the Power Hub. And that sort of really destroys a lot of the convenience of just plugging in a USB microphone to the iPad with no other electric con connection. Like for example, if you were, you know, if you were out and about and remote, what if you wanted to use an, a good mic and you didn't have a wall outlet to record? Well, Samsung suggested that you didn't, you know, that somehow it would work with the with the um, iPad without drawing extra electricity from a from a, a USB electric um, power adapter or something. And it doesn't say how it does it, so I bought this $99 mic, and sure enough, it works. And I did a, a short little demo video um, where I compare it to the Blue Yeti, and I'm going to play, play it for you now. But apparently, this is the solution. So if you're looking for a good microphone that works with the iPad, I, I've tested it, and it works with both GarageBand and iMovie and... Um, and what you're going to hear was recorded with the Samsung Meteor microphone. So here it is, and if you've got the video version, you can see it. Okay, this is a Max Future first look at the Samsung Meteor USB microphone. This is a condenser microphone that just came out, and it cost $99. And it's a little sucker, and it, you know, it's kind of cool. And here's what's cool about it. Well, you know, it's got this very funky retro look to it. It looks kind of sci-fi, very chrome-like, almost looks like a Star Wars character. And it's very compact, and basically its legs fold down, three legs, so you can prop it up on a desk. And um, let me just show you, here's the unboxing. It's not that big. So, you know, you can carry it around. Here's what the, um, the box looks like. It's very compact, very Apple-like box by Samsung. This is S-A-M-S-O-N. And you get a USB cable. And I believe this, there might be like a little bag in there. I haven't opened that up, but it fits very snugly. Like I say, you know, it's got a, um, you know, very compact, nice look to it. See, these are the, the, the three legs which fold up, which are kind of cool. I'm just, I'm trying to do this one-handed because I'm shooting with my other hand. See, and it just folds down. You get the, uh, the three legs fold down. Look, I'm doing it one-handed. And they prop up. And they, um, they prop up and they sort of, they're designed to angle in one direction, I guess the direction that you're speaking in. But you can play around with it, see how you want to angle it. But here's the best part. The best part is that it works with the iPad. Now, I've tried to use the Blue Yeti, and that's the Blue Yeti next to the Samsung Meteor. See how much bigger the Blue Yeti is just enormous the Blue Yeti and the Samsung's like a little sucker so it's much more portable like the iPad is portable but the best part about the Samsung is that it actually works with the iPad with the dock connector and you don't need a power hub now why do I say that because Apple did something to the iPad after it came out so that if a microphone takes up too much power the iPad won't work with it because I guess Apple doesn't want it to draw too much power from the battery. But Samsung made this somehow so that maybe it's not drawing too much power from the from the iPad. So you don't need a power USB hub. Now I've been looking for something like that, and you know this is a I'm re actually re I'm recording this on the Samsung so you get a sense of what it sounds like. I've got a sore throat, but that's the beauty of it. You don't need a power hub. This is one of the few microphones that actually connects to the iPad and you don't get the error that says no, it's drawing too much power. Now here I'm connecting the Blue Yeti and I'll show you like I, when I connect the Blue Yeti, which is a nice microphone, the Blue Yeti has three condensers. Now you see I get this error, cannot use this device, um, you know, because it requires too much power. So. 
The only way you can use the Blue Yeti with the iPad is if you get a powered USB. So any, anyway, this is you know my first look by MaxFuture.com. It's only $99, which is what the Blue Yeti cost when it's on sale. Thanks for listening, and check it out. I think it's worthwhile. Now, one group of companies that is embracing the iPad to expand or keep alive their business are the cable companies. And you would feel that you would think that they'd be threatened by the iPad since it's an alternative viewing area for media content. But according to GigaOM, uh, which runs the Apple blog, they had an article on April 28th entitled, Cable Company iPad Apps Are Killing It. And they basically report on how, you know, these cable companies are public companies and they had their earnings, quarterly earnings announced and they had earning calls with analysts this past week. And they revealed that there are, a lot of people are downloading their the iPad apps that they've created for their different cable networks. Time Warner Cable, which is my cable company, revealed that that the iPad app that they made was downloaded 360,000 times. Uh, Comcast, which has had its app out since November, has had its app downloaded one and a half million times. Cablevision, which is uh, also has an app, had 50,000 downloads in just five days of availability. So the point is that, you know, I think it's smart of these cable companies to provide this because it's an alternate way that you can see your television content. Now, I, I haven't activated the Time Warner app yet, and I'll try to report on it when I do. One of my frustrations with it is that you have to have an actual Time Warner account and find your login, your password for your account. And so I'm hunting around for that, and then I can activate it. But, you know, it hit me that I might be able to save a lot of money because right now I have two cable boxes in my home for two different TVs. And, you know, they charge you. Time Warner Cable charges, I don't know, $15, $20 a month for one of those boxes. And it has a DVR in it and all that. But if I could get rid of one of the boxes and and then hook up my iPad 2 to a TV and get pretty much the same content, then I could cut my cable bill. And... So it's kind of ironic that the cable companies are offering the iPad as a platform since the iPad as well as the Apple TV could be the things that eventually get you to cut the cord to the cable companies. Speaking of cable companies, just days ago, HBO, the content provider for the cable companies, announced a free app for the iPad as well as the iPhone called HBO Go. And the HBO Go essentially allows you to uh, have on-demand streaming of various HBO content if you're currently subscribed to HBO. Now, it's on a lot of the different networks, including uh, Verizon Fios, but it's not yet available if you are a Time Warner cable customer. I believe if you're a Comcast and some others. And... But it's really promising. I, I guess eventually it's going to come to me. Uh, I use Time Warner Cable, but this is huge. And basically, you're going to be able to um, w- watch all sorts of original programming, including True Blood, Game, Game of Thro- Thrones, Boardwalk Empire, Entourage, The Sopranos, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Sex in the City, The Wire, and more. And you're going to have access... It looks like you can have access over 3G as well as over Wi-Fi. So this is very promising. Uh, it, you know, if you think you might, if, if, if you think you're, this works with your cable company, you might as well download it and see if you can activate it. Again, it's on most of the, um, it's on most of the cable carriers and it will eventually come to Time Warner Cable. So look, you know, more and more people are embracing the iPad as this video content delivery device. Now, the state of one category of apps on the iPad is kind of lacking. And the lack of good apps in that area uh, called the weather apps was really brought to the forefront by a very interesting post by Marco Armand. On his blog, Marco.org, Marco Armand is the developer of the 
highly successful Instapaper app. And he had a post on April 26th entitled The iOS Weather App Market. And he basically thinks that the iPad, where there is no native Apple weather app, is really lacking of a, a really great weather app. And I've got different weather apps, and I kind of agree with him. They're all kind of lacking. He says the potential market is huge. Almost everyone checks the weather occasionally. This is, I'm reading from his post. It's even bigger on the iPad, he says, since Apple doesn't provide a built-in weather app. But it's also extremely competitive with established TV networks and big name services taking most of it and a lot of small developers fighting over the rest. But none of them offered the app that we wanted. He says most apps are targeted in either of two extremes extremely simplistic, lacking the information we sometimes want, or too information dense, full of numbers and measurements that weather geeks want, but casual people like us don't care about. And he says what we wanted essentially is a plus version of Apple's weather app with Apple's aesthetic style and minimal presentation, but with slightly more information available whenever it's relevant. And he goes on to say, for instance, a radar map is nice, but only when precipitation is imminent. He says approximate chance of rain estimates are helpful when they're non-zero, but they don't need to be precise, especially since they're predictions that often end up being wrong. A graphic would do instead of a percentage. So he makes a lot of really good points here that we're still waiting for the ideal weather plus you know, app. And, you know, I'm going to hunt around, um, you know, see if there, if you know of a great weather app, please let me know. Email maxfuture at gmail.com because I'm going to hunt around to see if I can find online an iPad weather app that sort of meets Marco Armand's aesthetics. Okay, here's a little tip if you're with your iPad in New York. Be careful, in particular, if you're in a Starbucks. There's a New York Times article on May 29th entitled, As the Careless Order a Latte, Thieves Grab some, Something to Go. And basically, it's a funny story, or not that funny if you're the victim, but apparently there's been a spate of iPhone and iPad robberies and thefts in various um, Starbucks throughout New York City. And police statistics, according to this reporter, show that a lot of iPads and iPhones have been stolen. Now, it could be that, you know, Starbucks is mentioned in this article, as the article points out, because there are really a huge number of, of Starbucks in New York City. And basically, the point of the article is people, people feel at ease when they're in a Starbucks and maybe look the other way or leave their knapsack for a second to go to, you know, to hang something up. And you should just be really careful when you're sort of having a latte or a coffee and sitting around a Starbucks because it's an ideal place to be pickpocketed. Or if, you know, you put your iPad to the side. Now, I've, you know, I'm very careful in New York because I'm always assuming there, there are pickpockets or thieves around. And so I always, like, you know, have a steady hand on my iPhone or iPad. I, I keep everything in sight. I put it in front of me, but you know, you I'll have a link to this on the blog, uh, maxfuture.com for this post. But read the story; it's really, um, it's really both funny and sad at the same time. Okay, if you are a big photographer and use Lightroom on the Mac a lot, you know, Lightroom is the competitor to Aperture, which is the photo management and and uh, image editing uh, program that's really you know for people who take photography seriously well there's an app apparently it's the first ipad app that works with adobe's lightroom and it's called photosmith and i first spotted it in an article in pc world and basically it says that photosmith is a fairly feature full featured photo organizer and that it can import photos for most, you know, digital cameras. But the big thing is that it's compatible with Lightroom. And um, apparently you can, um, you can import 
everything into uh, Lightroom from Photosmith, all your metadata, all your photos and collections, as long as you install the free Photosmith plugin for Lightroom on your Mac. So this is the first time Lightroom has had something compatible, I guess, on the iPad. Um, so you might want to check it out. Now, before you check it out, you, you might want to, you know, think twice because Photosmith isn't exactly cheap. It's $17.99. Now, the, the big feature really is this connection to Lightroom. But what you can do is you can, um, I guess you can import documents from certain cameras. The Canon and Nikon RAW files are fully supported. What's interesting is when you go to iTunes or the App Store, uh, I guess Photosmith got some negative reactions from some users because the first thing you see in big... Um, you know, letters sort of uh, highlighting the app are limitations and it's almost apologetic. It says, we don't pretend that the app is perfect for everyone. Each person works with their photos differently. Please note things the app cannot do in the current version. So it says, Canon and Nikon RAW files are fully supported. Other cameras may vary. Please check the compatibility list on our website. Your photos can only be sent from Photosmith to Lightroom. You cannot send your existing photos to the iPad in this version. So it's not like the way iPhoto works with the iPad, where you can take photos from iPhoto or Aperture and send them to the iPad. You can only send photos to Lightroom. You can't transfer Lightroom photos to, the, uh, to this app. It goes on to say, iPad does not allow you to delete photos from inside Photosmith. You must do this from the built-in Photos app and you cannot edit the actual image uh, in this app. Photos cannot be tagged in groups. But the things that you can do is you can organize and tagging. You can start organizing before you get back and the photos are fresh in your mind. You can create collections and keywords and assign them to photos. You can rate, label, filter, and organize photos. You can view EXIF information, including ISO, shutter speed, f-stop, etc. On the raw, raw workflow, you can view raw images even from pro-level DSLRs. It's support for raw plus JPEG. And, you can, and as for the syncing, you can sync your collections, keywords, ratings, labels. And you can import photos from, your, from the iPad directly to Lightroom over Wi-Fi. No other steps required. So this is pretty cool. You don't need to do sort of the you know, USB syncing, you can just do it over Wi-Fi. Alternatively, import the files via USB for faster speeds and then sync uh, your tagging over Wi-Fi. Huh. Um, and also there's some sh social sharing. You can share your photos with your family or friends or clients remotely using F Facebook, Flickr, or Dropbox. So it has some Dropbox integration. And you can select individual photos or entire collections for the sharing and share different sizes and choose the album. So look, you know, it's it's really for the person who has Lightroom. I would say if you don't have Lightroom, you, you probably shouldn't get this app since it does cost $18. Okay, so if you are into, I guess, the environment, uh, you might want to check out Al Gore's new app, which is a app book and it's called Our Choice and it just came out this week and it costs $4.99 and I guess it's now saying it's the number one book in the app store and basically the book and app features a multi-touch interface a visual table of contents for quick and easy navigation 250 full screen images and you can explore photos location on interactive map and, and more than an hour of documentary footage, 30 original interactive info graphics and animations, and original audio commentary by Al Gore throughout. Remember Al Gore I think sits on Apple's board of directors. It has an interactive 3D book cover and it looks really cool. I mean you might you know not be fanatical about the environment but still, just as an, uh, an app book, it looks very 
thorough and very um, very interesting. Now there is this little um, trailer that comes with it, and let's see if I can play it. Human civilization and the Earth's ecological system are colliding. The climate crisis is the most destructive and threatening manifestation of this collision. Okay, so, you know, the app in this video does look pretty amazing. I mean, it's very interactive. There's all sorts of charts. You pinch and zoom. You can bring up videos. So basically the book, you know, has writing in it, but it's also got all this very cool video animation showing, like, what the wind does with a turbine. You've got Al Gore, like, talking in it. You've got maps with all sorts of uh, pop-up windows that show you ecological use of, you know, solar energy and wind energy and how wind energy works. And I could see, actually, I've got young kids. I could see, I think I'm going to get this app because it does bring up a lot of stuff about energy and the ecology and, um, you know, how to save energy in the world. And, it, and it's it's kind of cool. So, you know, you could check out the video. If you do a Google search, you could also see this video. I mean, I have clips of this video in the video version of this um, podcast that you can get in iTunes. But I think, you know, this is, this is a new way to do books. And I think the publisher of this Al Gore book is going to come out with similar interactive books. Okay, so if you have a Wi-Fi iPad, one without 3G, there may be a new $1 app that you might want to get. It's called Air Location, and I just came across it recently. I think it just came out on April 27th, and it's kind of innovative because what it does is it, if you have an iPhone that has Wi-Fi hotspot sharing in it, remember at t now offers you that feature, I guess, for if you're on a $25 plan and for $20 a month more, you can you can turn your iPhone into a Wi-Fi hotspot. And that's great if you want to connect your iPad to 3G via your iPhone. But one thing that doesn't come over that connection is GPS location. And why would you care? Well, if you had the GPS information coming into your iPad, you could then run one of those navigation apps or your map on the iPad while connected and it would act as a you know turn by turn turn by turn um, navigation system on your iPad and you cur currently can't get that unless you have 3G in the iPad itself so what this simple one dollar app does is it allows you to get GPS for your Wi-Fi iPad and what it does is it turns on the personal hotspot, you, you turn on the personal hotspot on your iPhone, you connect your iPad to the personal hotspot, you start air location on both your iPhone and iPad, it's installed on both, and then air location on your iPad will now track your location based on GPS data provided by your phone. So this is pretty cool. Now I, I wonder though if this works if you jailbreak your iPhone and do an illicit Wi-Fi hotspot using my my Y. My Y is the um, is the jailbreak app that you can get from the City Store that turns your iPhone into a Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, without the permission of the cell carriers. So it's a little dodgy, but it's a way, you know, to take control of your iPhone and not have to pay extra to the AT&T or to Verizon to turn your iPhone into a Wi-Fi hotspot. You could hook up your iPad to it. Now, the only downside was the iPad wouldn't get the GPS data, but this little air location app seems to, might do the trick even for that. I mean, the air location description in the, in the app store says it's, you know, for when you're, you do the, I guess, the legitimate Wi-Fi hotspot through AT&T or Verizon. It doesn't say if it works with the jailbreak version, but it's only a dollar, so you could, you know, you could get it and experiment if you have jailbroken your iPhone and you do have the MyY 
uh, jailbreak app. Okay, so one app that I recommend for the iPad that costs only 99 cents that I started to use recently is called IA Writer. And it's basically a minimalist writing app that um, has very nice, simple typography. And it's, you know, a no frills word processor and has a nice keyboard with, um, you know, the quotes already there as keys. So you don't have to go hunting and, you know, with the normal Apple keyboard hunting to get the quote mark there. So it also has navigation keys that go left and right. One of the killer features of the app, though, is that you can export and save files directly to Dropbox as well as iTunes file sharing and email. Now, this is huge. If you don't have Dropbox, you should get it. It's a free service and a free app that allows you to sync in a folder in the Dropbox app uh, content to a Dropbox folder on your Windows or Macintosh computer or any other devices. So you no longer, and it does it all wire, wirelessly through the cloud, and it saves it in the cloud too. And a lot of apps on the iPad and the iPhone work with Dropbox, so they seamlessly can save and pick up things from J Dropbox. Now the Pages, I have Pages, which is Apple's word pro processor, but iWriter, what I like about it, it's very minimalist. There's no like themes or anything. It's really just text, and it really just saves documents as a text file, which is just a very universal format for all word processing. You know, pretty much any word processor will import a text file. It's basically very stripped down. And iWriter has gotten, you know, some pretty nice reviews. Oh, Malik said, if you're a professional writer like me, you're going to enjoy working on this app. O Malik is the, essentially the founder of Giga, which is a respected uh, website on tech stuff. And look, even the little reviews that there are there from customers are very high generally. So look, it's only a buck and it's a different word processing experience on the iPad. It's both in landscape and um, portrait view. And I, I recommend it, so you might try it out. It's only 99 cents. Okay, another app that's free that I recommend for the iPad is version 2.0 of TweetDeck, which just came out on, on April 26. And TweetDeck is essentially a client, so if you do use the Twitter service, um, this is how you can access it on the iPad, and I kind of like it. It's It seems like a really nice design. Um, you know, it's got some new features are supported, like you can send updates and retweeting and favorites mentions, and um, you can post to multiple Twitter accounts easier. It's got a Facebook status update, notifications, wall posts. It's, um, you know, it's much more involved, but it's got a really nice, clean window and, you know, UI. So again, look, this is free. I think it's one of the better um, clients for the iPad. There's Twitterific, and um, check it out. It's um, you know again, it's free. You have nothing to lose by trying it out. TweetDeck. Okay, so you know one of the problems I have with my iDevices, whether it's an iPad or iPhone, is sometimes photos get stuck in my iPad or i iPhone. And what do I mean by stuck? Well. Sometimes I transfer photos to my iPad. Sometimes I have photos sync from iTunes and iPhoto into my iPad. And I can't sometimes get them off the iPad. And sometimes I have too many to individually delete off my iPad. And what do I mean by this? Well, theoretically, let's say in iTunes for syncing content to my iPad, I check under iPhoto or Aperture, I check that I don't want any photos synced to my iPad. Well, I'll check that, but I'll still have some old photos on in my photo app on the iPad, and I can't get them off. And so what do you do? Do you go individually and delete them off? You could do that, but there's no easy way to do it. But I did learn this tip from other people on the internet, and there's a great app 
on your Macintosh, if you have a Macintosh, that really helps you deal with um, getting off um, your photos and deleting them in the iPad or the iPhone. You can also use this app to act in, in lieu of, of iPhoto or Aperture to, to import photos into your Mac. And the program is called Image Capture. It's a utility, and it's been around for a long time. And essentially what you do is you boot up Image Capture while you have the iPad plugged in, and it will show you all your photos in your iPad. And you can import those photos, or you can impo import just the ones that you want. But the reason I like Image Capture is that you don't have to import the photos. Instead, it lets you directly delete the photos that are in your iPad from image capture. So I'm going to show you how that's done. I have a, if you're watching the video version of this, I screen recorded myself doing that deletion. Okay, so this, if you're looking at the video, is a screen capture within the image capture program. And basically, so you have all the photos loaded in. I have like thousands of them. It, I had 1,420 1, photos and videos on my iPad. And basically all you do is at the very bottom of the screen, well first I select all, and then there's like a little red delete button and something comes on that says, are you sure you want to delete the selected 1,420 items permanently? And I clicked delete. And look, I click delete. And after I click it, watch what happens. There it goes, it starts deleting them one at a, one at a time. Now, I didn't screen record the whole thing, but the point is it deletes everything. Now, you only want to do this if you're sure that you've backed up these photos. So I went through all these photos and realized they were photos that had been copied onto my iPad from my iPhone or from iPhoto or Aperture already on my Macintosh. So these were photos that I was sure I already had duplicates of. And I just couldn't find any other way to delete them off. Uh, they were sort of stuck and taking up space in my um, iPad. And this also works with the iPhone. So remember, it's the image capture application on Macintosh. I don't know if there's a Windows version of this, but if you have a Mac, you should check it out. It's a very useful tool. So that's my tip. Okay, so if you're into protecting your iPad, you might want to check out a new cover or sleeve called the G-Form and it's called the G-Forum iPad Extreme Sleeve. But what's really interesting about it is on the internet, I found, I found uh, this video, which basically shows it being dropped from 500 feet and not breaking. In other words, it, it, they dropped it from a plane 500 feet, and it was in this sleeve. It's like a puffy yellow sleeve, and it still survived. So let's check this out. Hey folks, Tom here again with G-Form, makers of extreme protection for athletics, and the new G-Form Extreme Sleeve for consumer electronics. I'm about to show you our extreme drop iPad protection design. Okay, so in the video, I mean, they really do throw this iPad off of a plane at 500 feet. And then the guy who you heard is like running over and scrambling and picking it up. Now they had a camera attached to the iPad. I guess the camera broke. But the iPad, you know, is still in its case. And he's opening up the case. He's taking the iPad out and he's and he's looking at it and it's it's not broken. And he's very excited. Success. You know, he's celebrating it. Some guy comes over, takes a picture of it. And look, this is a very Soft effective advertisement Extreme to throw your iPad out of a plane so the in a case and show that it survived. So I don't know, you know, look you might that. want to check it out. It's called no G Form. G hyphen form. That's the name of the company. Yeah. And it's at gform.com. Finally, the website Gizmodo did a roundup of best apps for different devices. And for the iPad, it had a roundup of best apps. And I'll, I'll go quickly through what they did. I agree with a lot of the stuff they did. For social, well, I don't know. For the iPad, they had the Twitter app, but I think TweetDeck is a better one. They had Flipboard for social. That's that magazine-like 
uh, interface for seeing your social uh, streams. They had that in there. I'm not reading all of them. And for entertainment, they had iMovie. It's interesting. I think of iMovie not as an entertainment app, and they also have GarageBand as an entertainment app. I see them as content creation apps. I would have had a category called content creation because under entertainment, they lump in the TED app, which is a viewing of content app, together with GarageBand, which is a content creation app, as well as iMovie. They also have the Korg IMS-20 app that recreates the famous Korg synthesizer. Uh, so they sort of lump under entertainment various apps that are that are some are content creation and then some are some are just viewing content like the daily app from um, uh, Murdoch is there. I would agree with that. Google Earth is there. I mean, Google Earth, I see almost like as a utility or an educational app um, under games. They, it's interesting. They didn't have real racing HD. That's, I think, one of the best, best games on the iPad, and that's missing. Instead, they have World of Goo, which is a, which is a game, which is $5. Flight Control HD, uh, Monkey Island. Anyways, I have the links to all of these stories now on maxfuture.com. On when I post the, um, the podcast, you can go there and get the links. For productivity, they have a lot that I agree with. They have Instapaper. I've talked about that before. They have, uh, they have this iWriter. No, actually, they don't have iWriter. They have Dropbox, and they have Elements, which is a writing app. And no, they do have iWriter. They have iWriter, and they have Log Me In. Um, you know, so check it out. They they list a lot of interesting and good apps. Uh, many of which we discussed already on this show. So anyways, it's a good resource. So it's not a bad link. Okay, well, thanks for listening to episode 52 of the iPad podcast. And this is Lex at Max Future. Remember, I have a video version of this, of this podcast that's at Apple Things. Just, just do a search in iTunes for Max Future and you'll find the two different podcasts that I do, plus the video version of both under one stream. Also, remember, if you go to maxfuture.com, I'm starting to put now links for each podcast to the different stories and the different apps or the different content, so you can get that there. Uh, Also, you can show your support by, um, you know, giving me a positive review in iTunes or any sort of positive feedback would be appreciated. Someone was very kind recently to give a nice positive um, review in iTunes. And that helps me get more recognition in iTunes and more people listening. This is an amateur amateur podcast. Uh, I'm trying to just stick to a format with no commercials where I just cover iPad-related news, iPad-related apps, iPad-related tips, and not going on any detours or side ventures. Again, you can communicate with me by emailing me at maxfutures at gmail.com or you can leave a voicemail at 617-826-9676 if you have any questions regarding the iPad or any suggestion for apps or any observations regarding the iPad. I welcome a voicemail. You can also email a video or audio question by Gmail to me, to my Gmail address, and I'll try to play them in the show. Again, thanks for your support and see you next week.